So let's begin. Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for attending this month's science sem seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, uh, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly seminar series is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and NEON. You can find a lot more information about the, the seminar series on the webpage that I'm showing uh, right here. We are very excited to have Dr. Elizabeth LaRue as our speaker today. And before we turn it over to her, I will just go through a few logistics. So we have enabled the optional closed captioning for today's talk. If you would like to use that feature, please find the CC button in the bottom of your Zoom menu bar and go ahead and turn on the subtitles. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by a Q&A session. If questions come to you while you're watching the talk, please drop them in the Q&A box and we will moderate discussion at the end of the talk. Um, during the Q&A period, there should also be opportunity to ask questions over audio if you prefer to raise your hand. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation. This is outlined in our code of conduct. The guidelines apply to NEON staff as well as any participants in, the, um, who, in any programs we're offering as part of NEON. Please do review our code of conduct, uh, which can be found on our webpage. And lastly, to complement these monthly seminar series, we are hosting related data skills webinars, where you can learn more about how to access and use some of the NEON data that you might be hearing about in the presentations. Registration for those is available on this same science seminars webpage. If you, these are the, the talks. And then if you just keep going down here, um, here is the series of data skills webinar with uh, links to register for anyone who's interested in. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Elizabeth LaRue, who is an assistant professor in biological sciences at the University of Texas, El Paso. Her research uses big data and remote sensing to uncover mechanisms underlying spatial patterns in plant species distributions and ecosystem structure and function. She's a thought leader in the evolution of the new macrosystem science discipline, and we are so pleased to have her presenting today. With that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. LaRue. Thank you, Samantha. It is a pleasure to be here. Let's uh, get my screen up. And does that look good? Everybody sees? Yes, excellent. Perfect. All right. Well, yes, I'm pleased to be here. Um, are, you, are you seeing the toolbar? Just as a double check. We are seeing the toolbar, yes. Try to fix that. Is that looking better? Now we are not seeing your screen. Hmm. Okay. Okay, now we're seeing PowerPoint. So if you Go into slideshow mode. That that should work. Excellent. Take it away. Okay, perfect. We're good now. Okay, yes. So thank you for having me here. Um, so I'm uh, at the University of Texas at El Paso and uh, happy to share my work on looking at structural diversity as a predictor of ecosystem function across scales and ecoclimatic domains. So this is probably a very familiar challenge to the NEON community, whether you're a current or maybe a potential future NEON data user. Um, collecting data across macro scales, as illustrated by the, the large landscape photo here, is very difficult, but thankfully we have um, resources such as um, data sharing networks such as NEON and also other remote sensing tools that can allow us to get this macro system scale uh, data from local to landscape, regional, up to larger macro scales. 
so that we can understand ecological patterns across um, space. So indeed, as we've um, increased our capacity for this big data, macrosystems biology has become an emerging frontier in ecology. So this was a big literature review in the ecological literature space, um, looking at um, the uh, over three decades of abstracts in top ecological journals um, to show that the in this showing that the literature space in two dimensions using a principal components analysis, we mapped the um, common ecological themes um, showing as shown by the stars in the 2D literature space. The if you look at the bottom part of the um, graph, the turquoise stars indicate uh, topics that would indicate spatial scale, large scale, or things such as climate change or anthropogenic uh, type topics. And then the big yellow star is macrosystems biology literature, um, many of it coming from the NSF uh, program in macrosystems biology from the last uh, decade. So showing that at the edge of this ecological literature space over three decades, we have this new emerging frontier in ecology of large scale ecology, but also macrosystems biology, indicating its importance and emergence in um, our research. So narrowing in, so I as an ecologist focus on measuring ecosystem structure uh, with remote sensing and large scale data sets like NEON um, for understanding the functioning of ecosystems from local to landscape to regional to macro scales. So more specifically, I use uh, a type of diversity that we call uh, are calling structural diversity, and that's described as the three dimensional um, volumetric capacity, the physical arrangement, and the identity and traits of biotic components within ecosystems. So I have a little cartoon to illustrate what I mean by these different aspects of structural diversity. So the example is two different uh, forests. The one on the left would be the, has a larger um, volumetric capacity filled, but also has a more diverse arrangement of trees that have different heights and different um, structural arrangements. And also um, we can consider the identity of individuals such as species in the three-dimensional space of an ecosystem when we're thinking about structural diversity. It doesn't just have to be things like volume filled or the, the height of the canopy or the heterogeneity of the vegetation. We can also consider species identity or other tree identity in this. So structural diversity, you may or may not have heard a term or you may have heard terms similar, things like structural heterogeneity or structural complexity is not a new idea in ecology. However, um, we argue that it is a relatively overlooked um, concept of diversity in ecology. So it has early um, history in the 20th century with um, sci notable scientists such as MacArthur and it also has a strong history in forestry. However, in the part of um, our new renewed interest in structural diversity is that our technology to measure it across spatial scales has rapidly advanced in the last several decades. But we're still at a point where we do know it's an important conceptualization of diversity for ecosystem pattern and process, but we still are lacking in knowing when it's important, where it's important, and to just general spatial patterns. So to try to uh, address this gap in the literature, um, in 2020, my colleagues and I had a workshop that was supported by NSF and ended up being virtual because of COVID. Fortunately, um, we partnered with NEON on this and brought over 70 scientists together to talk about what is a consensus definition for structural diversity? How does that um, 
what does that mean to different back, like interdisciplinary backgrounds, like if you're a geologist versus an ecologist or maybe an earth system scientist. And then identifying key research questions and also providing um, some remote sensing training geared at early career scientists. So as a, a product of that workshop, we've been working on a special issue for Frontiers in Ecology of the Environment that will address um, this overarching foundation for quantifying structural diversity and its conceptualization across ecosystems, but also providing ecological examples of ecological ab applications and new hypotheses um, for the literature and talking about um, methods for measuring it. So that'll be coming out soon. So the, so our goal for today is to talk about um, understanding how, what the ecological role of structural diversity is, specifically focusing on ecosystem function. So I want to point out that we can quantify structural diversity um, from across many different spatial scales and levels of biological organization from molecules, for example, proteins have structure, all the way up to populations, communities, and then to landscapes and macro systems. So I will primarily be focusing on the community to macro system scale today. But if this is an interesting topic to you, there's plenty of space in there for uh, new researchers to come in and understand patterns of structural diversity and its ecological role across these different biological levels of organization and scales. So a little roadmap for um, the topics we're going to talk about today. So first I'm going to describe some tools for measuring structural diversity um, from a local plot scale up to a larger macro system scale, and then talk about two um, studies where we show example, my colleagues and I have showed examples that structural diversity is um, related to ecosystem functions. So first forest productivity across North America, and then microbial diversity in the central hardwood region. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some ongoing cross ecosystem work. So thinking about um, tools to measure structural diversity in a macro, uh, macro system framework, because you need to go, you have to have good quality data, not just at a large scale, but you need to be able to have local and landscape to regional to macro scale um, coverage of your data. So of course, in all, um, all things measurement of any type of ecological pattern or process, there's a trade-off between spatial scale and resolution with the sensor that you're using to measure said uh, pattern. So for structural diversity, that is also very true. So when thinking about measuring structural diversity using <clears throat> remote sensing, there's a trade-off between high resolution um, sensors such as terrestrial or handheld sensors and drones where you have high resolution data, but your spatial extent is quite a bit smaller compared to things such as aerial or satellite uh, platforms where you have a large spatial extent, but you have typically a coarser spatial resolution in your data. So past work has shown that terrestrial LIDAR sensors are quite sufficient for measuring um, canopy structural diversity aspects, um, things such as a backpack TLS unit, which would be um, terrestrial laser scanning, illustrated in the, the picture, the guy's wearing the um, LIDAR backpack unit. So we know that we can get good resolution of forest canopy with these technologies. So in the study, but we wanted to scale up using NEON AOP LIDAR um, and make sure that our structural diversity metrics were getting good agreement with our TLS uh, metrics. And there's also a little bit of a difference in the way these two sensors collect data. So the TLS sensor is, so you're wearing it and it's going, looking up from the understory, from the ground up into the understory of the canopy. So you're getting a high density of data points um, lower underneath the canopy versus the airplane, the sensors flying across the landscape and providing a high density um, 
data product at the surface of the canopy. So this difference in data viewing and um, density could also influence the agreement between the two types of sensors. So to test this, we looked at the agreement between TLS and um, ALS um, across seven NEON sites to establish the feasibility of upscaling these structural diversity metrics um, using the little backpack unit that uh, the Franklin Wag Wagner was a master student who was working on this project. Um, so we had that TLS data from that backpack unit shown across these seven sites, and then, of course, NEON's um, aerial observation platform provides free standardized um, aerial LIDAR across all their sites. So we use that as our ALS data product. So, okay, so I keep mentioning structural diversity metrics. Um, so we have five categories of structural diversity metrics that describe different dimensions of the uh, canopy. Um, so things like category of height, so it's the mean or max height of the canopy or the median height, the density of vegetation, so this would be equivalent to something like an LAI metric, um, covered openness, so how many gaps do you have in your canopy, and then also measures of external and internal heterogeneity. So internal heterogeneity metrics measure how rough the sur outer surface of the canopy is, whereas internal heterogeneity metrics measure how, heterogene how heterogeneous the internal vegetation he um, heights are. So, and if you are interested in using NEON LIDAR data to measure these uh, structural diversity metrics, there's a tutorial on the NEON website that we created to provide an introduction to these structural diversity metrics using the um, LIDAR product. So we could check that out if you're interested in using the on LIDAR to measure structural diversity. I'll just give a second in case you want to jot down the uh, URL there. So indeed, we did find that there was good agreement between the um, TLS and ALS um, technologies, um, except for one category of metrics, and that was external heterogeneity. So we used Spearman correlation coefficients to test the um, strength of the linear relationship between the, the metrics from each sensor. And we counted anything above 0.6 as um, good agreement, and we counted those as relatively like good equivalent that we could scale up from terrestrial to aerial technologies. So we can have a, a larger macro scale look using those structural diversity. So the category that didn't have good agreement was external heterogeneity. The correlations were either insignificant or below that 0.6 threshold. And we attribute that to the different viewing angle of the sensors, like the terrestrial lighters looking upward and the airplanes looking downward. Since external heterogeneity would be measuring the surface roughness, we recommend that you would use the um, aerial LIDAR for that um, type of measurement. So another, this paper just came out um, looking at just a little bit of a caveat that I'll men mention briefly, that depending on which metrics you're using, um, some of them can be more sensitive to low density LIDAR. So I know with the NEON has some really great new sensors that they've gotten in the last couple of years, which provide typically much higher resolution than eight points per meter squared, but some of the earlier um, products at different sites can have that maybe like four points per meter squared average. So in the study, um, if you're interested, you could take a look, but um, just for time's sake, I'll just mention that some of the metrics were a bit sensitive to those lower densities, but there were plenty of metrics that you could choose from that weren't sensitive to the lower density LIDAR. So depending on what type of LIDAR data you're using or where you're getting that or which years, something to keep in um, keep in mind if you're going to be measuring structural diversity with these data products. Okay, so now we've talked a bit about measuring um, structural diversity across space. 
and some remote sensing tools to do that. And actually in my next um, piece of the outline, we're gonna talk about using forest inventory data to measure structural diversity and then testing that as a predictor of forest productivity across North America. So in ecology, it's a known pattern that biodiversity typically measured as the number of species in an area is um, correlated with ecosystem functions. However, as illustrated by the um, example study shown here, the strength of those relationships can often vary across space or with environmental conditions. So the, the example here on the slide, the map, the different color shading indicates there's a positive relationship between the number of tree species in an area and the, the forest productivity. However, the strength of that relationship varies quite substantially across um, the globe uh, regionally, depending on which uh, region you're in. So my colleagues and I thought, well, maybe structural diversity could be a um, interesting predictor of things such as uh, forest productivity. And we hypothesized that it might provide a really good proxy and potentially a better proxy of a niche space filled than um, things such as species richness that's often used in these um, biodiversity ecosystem function studies. And the, the rationale for that is if you look at the cartoon on the slide down at the bottom under species diversity, as we increase the number of species, so in this example, different tree species, those species aren't always functionally distinct on the niche axis that would be promoting our uh, ecosystem function. And because that the, the uh, species aren't always functionally distinct, counting the number of species isn't always a strong uh, predictor of ecosystem function because you're not filling that niche space. Um, in contrast, structural diversity measures a functionally distinct aspect um, of the stru some structural aspect of the ecosystem where in the example um, under the structural diversity um, cylinders there in blue, as we increase the number of trees of different size, we have functionally distinct individuals that are using some niche axis, maybe something like light um, competition, and they're filling the niche space differently in such a way that it would um, promote ecosystem function um, more than an equivalent number of tree species in the example. So we wanted to test this hypothesis and to do that, we pulled national forest inventory data from three countries of North America, um, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And from these inventories, they have, they all measure the diameter of the trees, the height of the trees, and also have a species identity provided from the individuals that they've measured. So we took advantage of this, um, and this is relatively common forest inventory data. We wanted to generate uh, metrics that would be relatively easy for, to use for forest managers with available data that they're used to using. And we generated uh, three measurements of structural diversity, and then we had our tree species richness, which would be our traditional uh, diverse species diversity metric. So the first structural diversity metric was horizontal richness, which would be represented by the number of trees in a sampled area that differed by different diameter classes um, of the trunk. And then vertical richness would be the number of individuals that had different, um, counting different height classes. And then 3D richness is a, a combination of the two, um, normalized combination of the two. And then the in the map, we have the species richness in the bottom right-hand corner. So because these three forest inventories do sample, they use um, similar sampling methods for diameter, height, uh, species identity, but they do sample different plot areas. So we had to account for that. We used hill numbers to estimate the um, effective richness value for 10 individuals. So that's why the, the scale bars would approximately, the, the values would scale from um, one to 10, um, being one being the lowest number, you'd have one in the, one species or one um, horizontal or vertical richness class. 
filled and those 10 individuals, or you could have up to 10. And then yeah. um, pattern, the, the map is showing a um, average, yeah. plots are averaged across the 20 by 20 meter um, pixel grid. So I want to point out a couple noticeable patterns and differences in structural diversity versus species richness. So both horizontal richness and vertical richness, we see higher values of richness in the Eastern United States and the Western, um, Pacific, particularly the Pacific Northwest. Whereas with species richness, we see our highest um, richness values in the Eastern United States, but then Southern Mexico and the Yucatan. So we see some pretty large differences in spatial patterns of the larger richness values. And this may translate into relationships with structural diversity versus species diversity and their ability to predict productivity. So to test if structural diversity versus species um, diversity was a stronger predictor of productivity, we used the inventory um, information where we looked at productivity with a proxy, um, in this case, basal area increments. So how much diameter did a tree um, increase each year? And that was our response variable. And then the different four different diversity metrics were the predictor variable. So past research, so we're, we're working with a large spatial scale here, and there's a lot of environmental and climate heterogeneity. And past work had shown that climate space is important in determining the strength of the relationship between tree species richness and productivity. So we used a, a approach used by a past group um, and split the data into different climate units. So we split the, the data into precipitation and temperature quantiles, 10 each. So we ended up with 10 different climate quantile units. So that represented by 100 different models in each of our diversity productivity um, regressions. So the way this is summarized here. Uh, the graph on the left shows the frequency of those um, climate quantile um, units, how many of those diversity um, predictors of productivity models had a specific R squared value and showing this as a histogram. And species diversity is the pink histogram. So this is the one here on the, the far left. And then the structural diversity metrics are the purple, green, and blue. And you'll notice that the purple, green, and blue histograms have a distribution skewed more to the right, where there's higher, R, more models with higher R squared values. And if we look at this um, slightly different way and take the difference for each of those climate quantile units, and we subtract the structural diversity metric R squared, model R squared, from the species diversity model R squared, um, across the 100 models and look at the difference, um, both the distribution with a violin plot, but also the average difference between those models. So the zero line above the zero line indicates structural diversity uh, or shows that structural diversity was predicting more variation in productivity than species diversity. If it's below the zero line, species diversity was predicting more variation than structural diversity. So the violin plots are skewed above the zero line, and then the averages are positive, ranging from 0.7 to 4.1% um, average, higher predictive variation um, in structural by structural diversity metrics than um, species diversity. So this analysis was across um, all of North America. So we did a second complementary analysis, but took stand age into account because we would expect that structural diversity might increase with stand age. So we included it as a covariate in our analysis. However, we had to, we could only, we only had data to do this with um, the United States. So this um, analysis is covering the extent of the USA. And similar or same setup, with the regression models, with diversity predictor of productivity, in this case, periodic annual increments of biomass. So between two time periods, how much biomass did the trees in, uh, in the plot increase um, on an annual basis? 
And we see a similar pattern where the, if you look at the histogram on the left, the R squared, the adjusted R squared um, histograms are skewed more to the right for the structural diversity versus the species diversity. And in the violin plots with the difference, we see that structural diversity had higher, um, predicted more variation in productivity than the uh, species diversity metric. And that ranged from 1.7 up to 8.3% higher, depending on the metric. So this um, suggests that across this heterogeneous um, forest ecosystems across North America, that structural diversity could provide a complementary tool for forest management to increase or enhance and manage um, ecosystem function like productivity. So just a, another tool in the forest ecologist or forest manager's um, uh, arsenal for um, managing ecosystems for functions. So I want to uh, zoom in a little bit to a smaller regional scale and thinking about structural diversity and how that might look or how that might relate to much smaller organisms, um, soil microbe communities in the central hardwood region. So this was a, so I'm more of a forest ecologist or ecosystem ecologist and remote sensing scientist. Um, so me and some of my other colleagues um, teamed up with some soil microbiologists and biogeochemists to test the hypothesis whether forest structural diversity would be a significant predictor of the microbial diversity of forest uh, soil communities, because we expect that with higher structural diversity that um, would provide an indicator of greater microbial habitat. It's a forest to microbial like, trophic interactions. So to test this hypothesis or to test the prediction for our hypothesis, we had uh, data from the central hardwood region um, in the Midwest and we had 38 plots where we obtained forest inventory data from the Indiana DNR. And they sample the um, trees um, over a certain size um, in a seven meter radius circle. And from that, they um, our Indiana DNR collaborator collected soil cores for us um, on the east and west side of the plot, and which was homogenized and sent back to um, Stephanie Kivlin's lab for analysis for the microbial community and to Rich Phillips' lab um, at IU to um, get uh, analysis for soil nutrients and pH. And then we extracted the uh, USGS 3 depth LIDAR from around the spatial extent of these plots and um, calculated several structural diversity metrics like I was showing earlier with the um, tools for measuring structural diversity with the NEON data. So similar metrics there. And um, Ashley Lang is a postdoc at IU and she uh, was instrumental in leading this effort. Um, it was a big group of us and she wrangled us all together and helped us test this hypothesis. So we looked at two different um, aspects of microbial diversity. First, we looked at alpha diversity of the bacteria, total fungal community, and then the ectomycorrhizal fungi community and the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi community. So we did not find that structural diversity was a particularly important predictor um, or a correlate of the soil uh, microbial richness. Um, However, we did find a significant positive relationship with vegetation area index, which would be how dense the vegetation is. As that increased, we saw higher ectomycorrhizal fungi um, diversity. So indicating that there is a relationship, it just, it wasn't a predominant, um, structural diversity wasn't a predominant uh, correlate of the soil microbial richness of these groups. And then we also looked at soil microbial community composition um, as beta diversity. So how different is the composition of the um, microbial communities 
among clots. And we looked again at bacteria, total fungi, um, arbuscular, and ectomycorrhizal fungi. So we looked at the relative predictive ability of structural diversity, but also tree diversity, um, soil properties such as soil nutrients and pH, and also stand productivity and age, because these are other factors that have been shown to be important predictors of microbial community composition and diversity too. So we did find that structural diversity was uh, a significant predictor of microbial community composition um, for every group except the um, AMF fungi. Um, however, structural diversity in comparison to particularly soil properties, so things like soil pH, um, soil carbon and nitrogen, the soil properties were much stronger predictor of the soil or the community composition, um, whereas structural diversity was a weaker predictor. So this is a, as far as we're aware, there haven't been um, many studies looking at vegetation structural diversity and how that relates to microbial communities. Um, so we thought this was a, a good first step and we're excited to keep working as a group and understanding how structural diversity may relate to the, the microbial communities. So I've showed you that structural diversity um, in two instances can be a um, correlate of uh, forest productivity, but also of microbial um, diversity. And then, so the examples I've showed you thus far have focused on forests, and that's been predominant in the literature. Um, most researchers have been focusing on forests, and that in part has been a technology uh, challenge, but as we have um, much better access to things like um, uh, UAVs and also like handheld sensors, like my iPhone has a LiDAR sensor on it now that's now readily available to many people. So with this um, advanced technological advances, uh, my lab group at UTEP, we're going to be expanding to consider how structural diversity across grasslands, shrublands, and forests, um, so looking at 15 neon sites in the Southwest and Western United States, we're gonna be looking at how structural diversity, ecosystem function relationships vary across these different ecosystem types that have very different vegetation volume. And just a little bit of a preliminary look, um, comparing structural diversity in a grassland versus a shrubland. So this is um, at Hornada Experimental Range. Um, this is a neon site in Southern New Mexico, um, Chihuahuan Desert Habitat, but we have um, so we have a lot of shrub encroachment there and also native grasslands. So this is data looking at rumpel, which is a measurement of the roughness of the canopy surface. And it's twice as high in the shrubland as it is in the grassland. So my, my group, um, some new grad students working in the lab are gonna be working with me and we're gonna be expanding this work to look more extensively at how uh, structural diversity patterns vary from grasslands, um, shrublands to forests, and also how that links to different ecosystem functions. So stay tuned exciting uh, research coming soon. And then as I wrap up today, um, so structural diversity is not a new idea in ecology, but it's an up and coming new area of research that has been fueled by new technological advances, particularly in re remote sensing and data sharing networks that now allow us to measure structural diversity in three dimensional aspects of ecosystems and um, communities across different spatial scales. So now that we have better tools that are improving every day, we can start to investigate how structural diversity is related to different ecosystem processes. So today I showed you some examples where structural diversity could promote ecosystem function as well as, or perhaps better than biodiversity. Um, suggesting that structural diversity has potential to be um, a new 
monitoring or management tool and may help us better understand ecological patterns and services um, under global climate change um, and other global change issues. So not saying that we shouldn't use things like traditional metrics like species diversity or species richness um, as a specific example, but structural diversity can provide something in addition to that and may help us better manage our ecosystems. So feel free to reach out. Um, so my email and uh, Twitter's there on the left. And I would like to thank the um, landscape ecology member lab members at UTEP. Um, lots of great um, early career scientists working with me there um, at UTEP. And then as many of you know, with this um, large scale macro systems research, we have lots of um, collaborators that go into making this uh, type of research possible. So um, I'd like to thank some of my um, collaborators, but also many more that I didn't have time or space to list today. Um, but, and also of course, um, my funding sources that supported the research that I showed you today. And let's see, I believe we probably would move to Q&A now. Absolutely. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, so much interesting science there and food for thought. So we've got a few questions in the Q&A box that I can read to you, Elizabeth, if that sounds good. And then maybe we can do an order. We could take um, one or two of the written questions. And then if anyone does want to ask a question by unmuting and just asking it over voice, you could do raise your hand and we could potentially alternate between written and oral questions if anyone wants to, um, to ask one. So let's the first one um, that came in kind of in the middle of your talk. How do you measure the sensitivity of the LIDAR pulses if it's eight points per meter squared versus four points per meter squared? Yes. So that particular study we looked at, we took neon data that neon LIDAR data that was um, high density over at least 25 points per meter squared, and we simulated random thinning of the point cloud. And then we measured the same metrics across that two points per meter squared up to 25 points per meter squared, and then looked at the stability of those metrics. So if they fluctuated a lot at the low density, that was when we indicated that, oh, this metric is probably gonna be pretty sensitive to that low point density because you have a lot of randomness about where the laser hits an object and then returns some information. So, Neat. And then there's another um, written question here. Aside the biodiversity productivity relationship, which as far as I know is debated in certain circumstances, do you have plans to test the responses of other ecosystem functional properties to structural diversity? Yes. So we have productivity. And now that I'm in the Southwest, um, I'm talking with lots of rangeland managers um, and also thinking about things like shrub encroachment and restoration and other ecosystem services that would be less about how much biomass is in the like forest, for example. So living in the Midwest, you have I don't know, I often would think more about forests, but now living here in the desert Southwest, trying to strike up some local collaborations. But then also you could think about things like wild, uh, wildlife habitat provisioning. Excellent. Um, let's see, I am seeing somebody raising their hands. Um, are we able to unmute Ebenezer to ask a question, please? Go ahead. Yeah, that's a very good presentation from Laurie. Uh, I have some few questions here that I would like you to shed more lights to. Now, if I have to extract data from neon size and uh, in relation to structural diversity, now, do I have to uh, apply remote sensing to such data? I mean, when I'm not going physically to the site to collect the data, how do you maneuver 
secondary data, I mean pre-existing data in consonance with uh, uh, LIDAR. And then the second one, if I want to analyze structural diversity, what do I need to collect? What type of data do I need to extract from forest inventory? And uh, aside productivity, which you actually measured, what other ecosystem services do you think one can test for? Yeah, those are great questions. So the way, at least with NEON, they have, depending on which data product you're interested in working in, it's typically geo-referenced. So the way I typically work with the those data products, things like the, they have like base plots, um, I usually just go in and extract, I'll just cut out the LiDAR data that I need and then process it. So that, and I, I use R typically, I know some of my collaborators use Python, it just depends upon which geospatial software you, you're most comfortable with, but you can set up those workflows to um, select your locations that you want to um, pull data from, like if you're trying to match it with some other NEON data product, and then just select the, the LiDAR data that you need. But that, you might also be interested in landscape level structural diversity patterns, and then you probably would take a different approach where you're just working with the entire extent of the NEON LiDAR footprint from the AOP. Um, and then with forest inventory, so you asked about forest inventory data. So I pulled um, species, identity and then also typically there's diameter so they usually measure that at about 1.3 meters height they have some sort of a measuring tape and then they go and measure the diameter of the trunk of the tree stem um, that's really common and then a lot of inventories at least the ones I worked with will also have uh, height data for some of their trees or all of their trees and you could extract even if you just had diameter you could measure some sort of metric of, and you didn't have to necessarily do it the way I did, but the way I did it was I split the um, diameter data into different size classes, like five to 10 centimeters, 10 to 15 centimeters, um, and so on. And then counted those similar to species richness, where I counted if we had a tree of a certain diameter, that was a one value of one for richness, um, and then so on and so forth. And you can kind of almost just treat it like species richness in that case. Um, so a little bit different depending on the type of data that you have. And really it just, it's rather uh, up and coming and we don't have a necessarily established specific structural diversity metrics. There's a number of groups that have been working on these studies, but maybe you have some creative ideas about your study system and what structural aspects that you think would relate to ecosystem functions, or maybe you're looking at wildlife habitat, or maybe more ecosystem services or human populations. It just sort of depends upon what you're interested in. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking the question, Ebenezer. Um, we got a few more that came through through the Q&A, so I'm happy to read those. So Zoe Le uh, Lieb says, such interesting research. Thank you. Are you aware of any other specific labs or universities engaging on this topic? I'm interested in exploring structural diversity as a PhD research topic. Is UTEP leading on this topic? I don't know if you want to say something briefly, but you know, maybe Zoe should email you or tweet at you. you no, talk. I, I think that would be a good, um, we could set up a chat, Zoe. Um, there are other groups. Um, but it, yeah, so like the lab that I did my postdoc in is at Purdue and they're doing a lot of the, they're calling it digital forestry and they're doing a lot of work focused um, on forests and how the structure and different remote sensing platforms could be used to improve forest management um, and forest ecology. But there are other groups. Um, there's some groups that are doing coral reef, um, let's see, Greg Asner, um, let's say Kim Calders and Josh Madden are all groups that are working on coral reef and thinking about structural diversity. They measure it with drones using structure for motion. 
those those are just a quick couple quick examples but if you want a more in-depth answer uh, feel free to reach out and we can have a chat awesome thank you so another one um thanks for this great talk could you expand on how to upscale field measurements to larger spatial scales when you also use satellite data that has different temporal scales. Yes, in that um, there are groups, I haven't worked as extensively with satellite data. I've stuck more with the, um, the aerial LIDAR versus the terrestrial LIDAR and then getting into the drones. But um, there are a lot of cool group or a lot of good groups doing cool research with uh, JEDI data. If you're familiar with that, it's a NASA sensor up on the International Space Station. And there, um, I know they're doing a lot of upscaling. So the JEDI footprint is 25 meters. And they're trying to upscale to use things like Landsat as a proxy to get like global biomass maps or other like forest height or structural aspects. So I think that would be a, a good place to look into if you're interested in that further beyond uh, what I can provide as an answer. Awesome. Um, not seeing any hands, so I'll keep going. There's a few more in the Q&A. Um, so somebody asked, is the structural, are your structural diversity maps based on forest inventory? Um, so are the displayed indices only for forest ecosystems everywhere? So I'm thinking you're referring to the map where I showed of North America. So yes, that is forest inventory data. And that was based upon the like Canada and United States and Mexico. They have like a sampling grid where they have different plots across their whole country area. And so that's ex, uh, extrapolated out, it's averaged out to show like a nice visual, um, but that would not include things like rangelands or wetlands or grasslands, um, for example. So that thus far is forests. Awesome. And um, Actually, one of our NEON staff members says, thanks for an excellent and interesting talk. What ground collected data could NEON ideally offer to support the work you are doing? Obviously, besides what we are doing or just maybe what are your favorite ones of what we're doing already? I mean, I really love it when there's good geo reference data to be able to link the um, other data, like the TOS products um, to the AOP products. That really helps. Um, I know. I haven't worked on this so much, but I know some people have looked at like there's the, the vegetation structure data where they have like different, um, I think there's some tree height data in there too, but they also geo reference the larger trees above a certain size. And I think that's pretty helpful if you want to try to get like a really good connection between the LIDAR or other AOP mm -hmm. products and the forests. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, by the way, Zoe says, thanks. Um, I will drop you an email. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, Sarah asks, are any of the NEON sites wetlands? And if so, is anyone looking at applying similar methods, asking similar research questions? I'm a PhD student looking at these kinds of questions in Canada, but having a hard time finding good LIDAR or other ground data in wetlands. I do believe some of the many of the neon sites do have wetland land cover. You probably would need like a land cover map. Um, I haven't specifically looked at wetlands. Maybe this is a good, also a good question for some of the neon folks. Um, but there's also right um, aquatic sites and there's like riparian habitat. So I would assume yes. <laughs> Yeah, we certainly do have some sites that have at least a wetland component, whether they're ephemeral um, seasonal wetlands. We have a bunch of sites with woody wetlands, the northern forests, as well as some down in the south and um, southeast. So there are different kinds of wetlands, no coastal wetlands, but there are some interior wetlands represented um, within the NEON data. And you would, of course, have all of the normal data that we measure, LIDAR, air, um, airborne remote sensing, as well as TOS data. So yeah, anyone who's interested in wetlands, I think we have, we're not a wetlands focused network, but wetland 
plots are represented in our sites. And if that's of interest, um, I encourage you to check it out. Thanks for the question. Um, let's see. So there's one more question about um, measuring structural diversity for a plantation, like a mono dominant plantation. If you want to try to have proxies for things like carbon sequestration or pollution removal, um, how do you think about structural diversity in uh, plantations? It's a good question. Um... I would be curious to know the answer, the more detailed uh, answer to the, that question. But I guess I would think about things like sometimes in a plantation, you might have different like micro habitat differences that might cause, even if you have the same species, you might have differences in individual tree architecture. So maybe in that sense, you might be thinking more of on an individual level, um, getting into some I know there's some groups doing, I believe Kim Calder is somebody who's doing some cool temporal monitoring of forests with terrestrial LIDAR and looking at how the individuals change, like their branching patterns and growth patterns change over time. So I think that would be a cool connection with some of these other things like carbon sequestration uh, or air pollution. I don't know of anybody who's specifically linked air pollution to plantations and structure, but be interesting. Great. And yeah, someone used the Q&A to say, I have similar questions, but I'm thinking of incorporating flux data, which would um, make a lot of sense if that's an option. Um, does anyone else, I think that's, I'm seeing, we've covered everything in the Q&A. Does anyone else from NEON or external members want to unmute and ask a question or make a comment to Elizabeth? Um, actually, I saw one more question came through in the chat, so maybe we'll do one more over, over Q&A and, um, and then we can wrap it up because we're almost out of time. So um, Javier said, thanks, Elizabeth. Could you tell us about what is the level of correlation between the diversity metrics you computed and if you dealt with that in any way? Yes, so for the North America um, Forest Productivity Study, there was a correlation between structural diversity metrics and species richness of trees. However, the relationship was nonlinear in the sense that as you got to higher values of structural diversity, the species richness leveled off. So they weren't increasing at the same rate. So it's there's a relationship there, but it's not a perfect linear relationship. Great. I think we're out of time. I think we should call it. That was a wonderful presentation and a rich discussion. Thank you so much for being here, Elizabeth. And thank the rest of you for attending, asking great questions. Um, we will be back next month with another very interesting, we hope, talk. And we look forward to seeing you then.